So the first thing that we are doing is doctrine of Monroe Kelly. So when we talk about the doctrine of Monroe Kelly, without this, there is no importance of the chapter. So doctrine of Monroe Kelly is a very, very, very important topic for all of us. And let us try to understand doctrine of Monroe Kelly. The doctrine of Monroe Kelly says that skull is a closed vault. Yeah. So it says that skull is a closed vault. What do you mean by skull is a closed vault? Let us try to understand this. So skull is a closed vault. And any addition to this, the USP, the speciality of this uh, chapter lies in this single statement that skull is a closed vault. Unlike other organs, we don't have a freely expanding space or cavity in the skull. So everything relies on this fact that skull is a closed vault. Any addition, any addition to it is managed by, is managed by egress of CSF, egress of CSF and venous blood. Now what is the importance of this egress of CSF and venous blood and what is this doctrine of Monroe Kelly? Let us try to understand more. So when we see this, just see, imagine the skull to be like this. This is the skull that we have. So skull is a closed vault and what are the components of the skull? We have either the CSF we have the most important component that is the arterial blood, the arterial blood. Then we have the brain parenchyma itself. So the brain parenchyma and then we have the venous blood. So these are the four things that we have and we don't have a, don't, we don't have an empty space. So now this is the normal skull. This is the normal skull and the most important thing about the skull is that any addition to it will be a problem. Why? Because there is no vacant space. So now whenever there is mass, so try to understand what happens in case of a mass. Now imagine this is a mass, there is a mass inside the skull. Now mass is like a guest. You can take this mass to be a tumor. This could be because of a hemorrhage. So how to accommodate this mass is a big challenge. Now, what are the components? What are the components? Try to understand. The skull is not going to expand and so is the arterial blood. The arterial blood says, I am not going to compromise for myself. Why? Because if I go down, the complete brain will become ischemic. So we have this arterial blood which is not going to change. Then we have the brain parenchyma. The brain parenchyma which will say I am very important for the function of the body, I will not change. Students, if both will not change, then who will accommodate these masses? How, how you will accommodate this mass? So what happens? You know that some part of CSF is intracranial and some part is distributed in the spine. So brain will ask the CSF to migrate from the intracranial compartment to the intraspinal compartment and when this happens, some space will be vacated. Some space will be vacated. The similar thing is the venous blood is shifted from the brain into the peripheral, you can say, with capacitive vessels. So what is happening here? There is outflow of CSF. There is outflow of CSF into the intraspinal compartment. So CSF, some part of CSF goes out, some part. Similarly, some part of the venous blood drains out into the what the systemic part of the body so do you know that there is reshuffling of csf and venous blood and because of this reshuffling of csf and venous blood some space is evacuated and this space is actually utilized to accommodate the mass and thus this is a phase where you say that this is a compensated state so compensated state and this is the reason why in the early stages of hemorrhage or cancer or maybe a tumor, you don't have any presentation there. That's asymptomatic. Why? Because the hemostasis of your, you can say, the homeostasis of the brain or you can say the skull is maintained by reshuffling of CSFM, the venous blood. Now, what is the next thing? 
the next thing if this mass expands so let now let us see what to do if the mass expands so suppose there is expansion of this mass so the mass has expanded itself now how to accommodate this mass this is very important the mass is expanding there is some problem boss how to manage this already the csf is actually adjusted adjusted to the maximum yeah so there is expansion of mass so csf has already adjusted to the maximum it could have and csf says don't look at me i will not do any further adjustment now then the question is what about the arterial blood arterial blood says i am not going to negotiate for anything i want my space and if you want me to negotiate then be prepared for ischemia when you look at the venous blood venous blood says don't look at me also because i have done the maximum adjustment i could have now mass is expanding there is no space left over and you must have seen the small small openings in the skull and why are these openings what is going to herniate out so you cannot stop the intracranial pressure from increasing and thus this is the concept of what the brain herniation and brain herniation means you are going to encounter yourself with what neurological deficits and complication and this is what is known as a decompensated phase so now you can see how a normal brain changes from its normal state to a decompensated stage and this is very 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 important and this is explained by doctrine of munro kelly so what is doctrine of munro kelly it is it says that skull is a closed vault any addition to it is initially managed by the reshuffling or ingress of csf into the intraspinal and venous blood into the peripheral vessels or systemic circulation this is very important to compensate the brain but as the mass expands it is beyond the capacity and hence decompensated lesion occurs now try to understand this doctrine of munro kelly has also given us a very beautiful equation what is that equation let us try to understand doctrine of munro kelly says that cpp cpp is equal to map minus icp what do you mean by cpp is equal to map minus icp try to understand this is defined as cerebral perfusion pressure so cerebral perfusion pressure and this is equal to the mean arterial pressure what is map map stands for mean arterial pressure mean arterial pressure so we have mean arterial pressure we have cerebral perfusion pressure and what is icp this is intracranial pressure intracranial pressure now why this is very 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 important for you all now try to understand if the intracranial pressure is going to rise of course there will be decrease in cpp and this is very 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 important so try to see if there is increase in icp there is going to be fall in cpp and if there is fall in cpp students what is going to happen there will be ischemia and if there is ischemia there will be neurological deficits and this is the explanation of every pathology occurring in the brain so always remember this relation in exam if systolic bp is given if diastolic bp is given if intracranial pressure is given you can take out the cpp or anything you have to follow this equation this is very 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 important when we are in concern of cpp let me tell you the normal cerebral perfusion pressure the normal cpp is equal to 65 205 mm hg you can say even 70 205 mm hg always remember that less than 60 mm hg less than 60 mm hg is considered to be a critical value critical value this is very 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 important when we talk about the intracranial pressure the normal intracranial pressure ranges from 4 to 14 mm hg so when you talk about the intracranial pressure it ranges from 4 to 14 mm hg 4 to 14 mm hg important is important is more than 20 mm hg 
more than 20 mm hg this is considered to be what critical and this is important very 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 important so more than 20 mm hg is considered to be a critical value now we'll discuss about the intracranial hypertension but when we have started a talk on the concept of cerebral herniation or brain herniation 